Welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Welcome to the Madden America podcast. I'm Rebecca Troger, a doctoral student in counseling psychology at UMass Boston, and a member of the Madden America website's research news team. You can find our daily reports at maddenamerica.com backslash research dash news. Today, I'll be speaking with Dr. Jiyang Ma about her work studying the experiences of those diagnosed with serious mental illness in China and the monitoring responsibilities the Chinese state has placed on caregiving families. Dr. Ma, who is a cultural and medical anthropologist and disability studies scholar at the University of Chicago, is currently at work on a book project based on this research, tentatively titled Intimate Institutions, Governance and Care under the Mental Health Legal Reform in Contemporary China. We'll be talking about Dr. Ma's book project, as well as her work on psychiatric subjectivity and cultural resistance, Western and Chinese models of health, and more. Dr. Ma, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you for inviting me. So I wanted to start by asking you if you could tell us a bit about your current book project. What got you interested in this topic and what has stood out to you the most as you've been conducting your fieldwork in China and you've been sitting down to write the book? Thank you. This is a big question. My current project, as you very nicely introduced, is about uh, how families in China um, care for and manage people diagnosed with serious mental illnesses and how those family practices have been shaped by uh, psychiatric institutions and the country's recent mental health legal reform. I did a whole lot of field work for it. Um, I spent over 30 months across a span of eight years doing field work in um, psychiatric hospitals community mental health teams, uh, social work centers, human rights uh, agencies, and with families and patients, etc. Um, and also talking to uh, lawmakers and leading psychiatrists about the mental health legal reform. So that's the scope of my fieldwork. And uh, from that, my main argument of the book is that with the prevalence of involuntary hospitalization, uh, mostly led by uh, patients' families in China, there is what I call biopolitical paternalism in the country. That is, uh, the state basically is using a discourse of paternalism, the availability, for example, of involuntary hospitalization and the demand of uh, patient management to demonstrate um, its paternalistic care for its population. But at the same time, it also devolves uh, that responsibility of being paternalistic to patients' families. And of course, um, in this process, the subject of this paternalism is the patient being seen as a subject carrying pathology and risk, and that needs to be uh, monitored and policed for a proper social order. So that's the very, very core argument of my book. And what got me interested in this topic is that, so I was a psychology major in China uh, when I went uh, was an undergrad. Um, during that time, I got an opportunity to do a class project in a psychiatric hospital when, uh, where we had to interview a patient there. And th- that was also the first time I was in a psychiatric hospital. Uh, the patient I interviewed was a woman who was hospitalized, who had been hospitalized for 18 years. And um, during our conversation, she told me a lot of her desires to for freedom and to reconnect with her family, but also a lot of complicated emotions with her family members, etc. So since that time, the space of a psychiatric hospital um, really sort of like just fascinated me, not necessarily in the most positive positive way, uh, mm-hmm. I guess, but theoretically. I began being interested in how institution, the discourse around it, and people's practices with it shape our notions of what is normal, uh, what is a desirable relationship, and what is just in terms of a treatment, uh, in terms of treatment for a vulnerable individual. So, um, of course, that uh, that was just a starting point. And as I dug deeper into the topic, I also Uh, got exposed to the ongoing uh, mental health legal reform and the whole society's very loud discussion about 
involuntary hospitalization and the possible abuse of it, etc. So this attention to the institution and um, the simultaneous uh, happening of the legal reform got merged into uh, my current book project. I see. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I sure. have a lot of questions I want to ask you, but I think mm-hmm. the direction I want to go in is to I'm wondering if you can tell us more about that discussion that's happening in China right now mm-hmm. around involuntary hospitalization of legal reform, because our, our listeners might not know very much about that. Yeah, so um, the discussion actually happened, I think, around uh, the year 2006, when a woman was involuntarily uh, hospitalized by her family members, and her family members claimed that, of course, uh, she was mentally ill, whereas she herself was saying that she had inherited a lot of money from her deceased father, and um, being in a country, being in a culture uh, that is that was sort of misogynist, her family wanted her to just give that money back to the uh, to the family and um, or to put it in the proper use defined by the family, et cetera. So there's some uh, a lot of discussion about whether the person was exactly ill or whether he, um, the, the family was using that as a way to get a financial advantage. So a uh, human rights activist, a lawyer at that time, uh, who, whose name is Huang Xuetao, uh, she got involved in getting the person out and uh, really started the kind of media discussion about families' potential abuse of involuntary hospitalization in China. But of course, um, things got a little bit complicated because in China, at at least at that time, um, not just families could admit a person against their will, but also um, local government officials and other public entities as well. And um, so the discussion about potential psychiatric abuse later on got uh, pretty much rechanneled to the kind of political abuse, potential political abuse of uh, psychiatry and the psychiatric institution, etc. So the discussion has also been rechanneled and to a huge concern about false diagnosis and um, involuntary hospitalization based on the false diagnosis. But that kind of focus has overshadowed uh, the discussion about like um, if a person really has a need for uh, help for mental health services, uh, what kind of services they might need or what kind of services would actually help that person. So you can see in the kind of mental health activism the louder group is uh, people who think that they are just not mentally ill. They don't want to get rid of that label, at, um, absolutely. And uh, they don't want to have anything to do with people who have that potential vulnerability or needs, etc. So there's tension in the uh, activism as, uh, as well. So that's what's, uh, what has happened over the last 13, 14 years. Um, and um, as an upshot of that, um, activism, um, the mental health law, the first ever national mental health law in China uh, was passed in 2012 and um, went into effect in uh, 2013. And um, it did say that uh, psychiatric hospitalization should be voluntary in principle. But on the other hand, it also assumes that people with mental illnesses are under the guardianship of their, their family members. And it makes a lot of exceptions in terms of involuntary hospitalization. So there are a lot of loopholes that people have been using and um, because of the lack of alternatives in mental health services, many family many family members just think that they have to resort to involuntary hospitalization. They ha- have to deploy those uh, loopholes to get per- uh, people hospitalized, and um, and the state, of course, um, is also encouraging that because of uh, the need uh, it perceives in population management. So you're saying that involuntary hospitalization is seen by families and then encouraged by the state as a loophole or what are what are some of the loopholes that people are pursuing well i mean it's 
So the the mental health law uh, says that um, psychiatric hospitalization should be voluntary in principle, but that when a person has actual or potential danger to themselves, uh, the family family members can uh, hospitalize them against their will. And when a person has a, a actual or potential danger to others, not just family members, but also public sector agents like police especially can do that. And that sounds well and good, but of course, in practice, uh, people, because there's no no definition about what exactly is uh, actual or potential danger, uh, in practice, uh, many people deliberately read that more broadly and um, sometimes even manipulated the report of the situation, etc. I'm wondering if you could say more about the term biopolitical paternalism and also what you're finding about the role that families are playing in clients' mental health care. Sure. So before I talk about biopolitical paternalism, I should briefly say that um, in China, because of the long history of Confucianism and the history of high socialism, there is this ideology that the family and by extension the state has the responsibility and authority to take care of its subject and um, it will guarantee the lives and livelihoods of the subject. In return, the subjects will identify with and totally depend on the family and the state. So this is the ideology that is actually endorsed by many people in China. In the mental health legislation debate, uh, in response to human rights activists' critique of involuntary hospitalization, psychiatrists who drafted the law appropriated this uh, ideology of paternalism to say that by allowing for involuntary hospitalization, uh, they're actually doing what they call state paternalism or guoxiafuquan, literally just the state acting as a father. And that way, uh, China is actually taking care of of its citizens in a way that is way better than, say, the United States, where after deinstitutionalization, people with mental illnesses are just let to roam free and to be rotted on the street, etc. So that's their argument, and that's what they enacted in the mental health law. But of course, with this paternalism ideology, uh, its new subject is no longer, say, the filial uh, son or the working class people as in the socialist version of paternalism. But right now, the new subject of paternalism is the biological object that is carrying pathology and risk to the general public, and that should be uh, managed. So that's the biopolitical part of the biopolitical paternalism. And when the psychiatrist on behalf of the state is uh, appropriating this ideology of paternalism, they simultaneously uh, devolved the actual responsibilities of enacting this paternalism to the families. So by using this term biopolitical paternalism, I want to highlight both the ideological appropriation part, the subject formation part, and also the devolving of responsibility part. So that's the scope of biopolitical paternalism. How does that shape? family's behavior? That's the second part of your question. Um, So in my field work, I find that because of the high emphasis, uh, strong emphasis on institutionalization, on uh, pharmaceutical management, there's actually a lot of uh, conflict within uh, families. Although paternalism as an ideology imagines the manager as the powerful father figure, actually a lot of the responsibilities of care and management are carried out by women and the elderly, and they don't really have a lot of power or authority to coerce uh, people with mental illnesses or lived experience. So there's a lot of struggling between the two sides. There are a lot of mutual injuries, and there are also a lot of ethical ambiguities as well. For example, there's this constant argument about whether, say, lifelong institutionalization which some families that have the means would choose for people diagnosed with uh, serious mental illnesses constitute as care or abandonment. Um, This is probably the more extreme version of ethical ambiguities and controversies, but a whole spectrum of 
arguments happen in the family on a daily basis because of the arrangement of biopolitical paternalism in the country. I wanted to go back to because you mentioned that you were a psychology major mm-hmm. and that the this interview you did with a woman who was hospitalized for 18 years kind mm-hmm. of planted some of the seeds of the mm-hmm. work that you're doing now. So I wanted to hear more about how you came to do the work that you're doing and particularly how you came to study mental health care, madness, and disability, specifically as an anthropologist, how you think bringing an anthropological lens to these subjects differs from that of psychology, which you also studied. Right. I studied psychology as an uh, undergrad, but I guess when I was doing that, um, I was unsatisfied with the quote-unquote scientific paradigm of uh, psychology, especially uh, the quest for universal and also decontextual or detached understanding of uh, human psyche. For example, like uh, when I was in the psychiatric hospital talking to that woman, my task was only to use a DSM to listen to her symptoms and um, to confirm her diagnosis of schizophrenia. So I got um, dissatisfied by the paradigm. I kind of became a black sheep and um, chose to first uh, study uh, cultural psychology in my undergrad, uh, sorry, in my graduate years. But then even cultural psychology for me is uh, focusing too much on individual behaviors and emotions. And uh, I want a more historically and culturally and socially situated uh, understanding of individuals and communities. So I gradually went into uh, medical anthropology uh, thanks to some of the great medical anthropologists at the University of Chicago who sort of converted me over the process. Um, So I think, yeah, definitely the advantage of anthropology, uh, anthropology and medical anthropology is definitely a situated understanding and historical understanding of human behaviors, of a sociality, and also a kind of explicit acknowledgement of the value in our work because it is so uh, so much more humanistic and so much more interpretive in our uh, way of understanding human behavior. We know what, uh, we care about the values of our interlocutors and also we're more uh, transparent and conscious about our own value in doing research. So that, I think, is another advantage of the anthropological perspective. So related to that, that mm-hmm. you're interested in approaching things from a more socially and historically situated perspective, I was curious about your work. You had done us some research several years ago on mm-hmm. experiences and explanations of schizophrenia in China. Mm-hmm. And you found that patients and families used Chinese medicine and religious narratives to recuperate what you called the social person, which I think relates to sort of what you were just talking about and I found really striking and which (laughs) differs from Western psychiatry's view of the individual Mm -hmm. contextualized, which you just mentioned. I'm curious what those of us who work within the mental health system in Mm -hmm. China, the U.S. and elsewhere, where in the world, might learn from this concept that you wrote about of recuperating the social person. And Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about how we might better support the recuperation and healing of so-called social people who experience Mm -hmm. madness or severe emotional distress. Yeah, so... First of all, I think it's great that you're uh, you bring up the, this concept of social person. Mm-hmm. I don't think, say, psychiatrists completely ignore that. Um, for example, the psychiatrists who I observed in the field, they definitely listen to people's distress, um, especially relationship issues, etc. And some of them did try to uh, help with those issues by talking to uh, family members about how to better care for uh, the person by adjusting their own behavior. But because of the dominant biomedical and psychopharmaceutical paradigm, that kind of attention to the social aspects uh, of distress comes at most second, if not like way down the street um, for a lot of psychiatrists. And it's very ad hoc and um, it depends on the particular uh, practitioner. 
and um, and at the end of the day, pills are still the kind of dominant mode to solve the problem. By focusing on people's use of Chinese uh, Chinese medicine and um, folk religion in, say, the the treatment of madness, um, uh, emotional distress, etc., we see that people invoke a language that focuses not just on the anatomical body, but encompasses um, the human physiology, social relationship, and even the environmental processes into uh, the understanding and care and treatment of distress. And I would argue that some of the languages of Chinese medicine and folk religion have a much better capacity to allow for that kind of uh, relational reading of the human. And it's not ad hoc in a way that psychiatrists do personally. So uh, that's one thing that people are able to do with uh, Chinese medicine and folk religion. The other thing, of course, is that with the side effect, or some people would criticize even the term side effect and would just say the damage of psychopharmaceuticals, people use the substance of, say, Chinese medicine in order to correct some of the damages and to uh, to repair some of the damages uh, that psychopharmaceuticals uh, have done to the body. And that is also what has worked for uh, for them, but of course, in uh, in China right now, as a, a, as with many other places in the world, um, psychiatry is the dominant paradigm, and there's lack of say funding to research the uh, the use of Chinese medicine in uh, mental health care, and um, and also the invocation of folk religion is derided by many practitioners. So there's basically no space in in the discussion of in the mental health discussion of folk religion at all so i think what people in the helping prof- profession be it in china or elsewhere in the world um should do is to think about ways for us to systematically include and investigate these alternative paradigms, alternative care practices, and alternative languages to understand and treat and um, to care for uh, mental distress. And of course, the kind of integration and inclusion means that we need to uh, perhaps change our own paradigm of understanding and to use, for example, other indicators of what a good outcome is in treatment and in care. For example, it's not just um, a reduction of some positive symptom, quote unquote positive symptoms. So uh, there is much to be done in terms of how we can actually systematically include and integrate those paradigms. So to follow up on on what you were talking about, I'm wondering if you could say more about how the language of Chinese medicine and folk religion has a different or better capacity to allow for a relational reading of of others. Yeah, sure. So, for example, um, there is a a common conception that, um, at least among some circles of academics, that uh, Chinese medicine only focuses on the somatic side of things or the bodily side of things Mm -hmm. and um, doesn't pay a lot of attention to people's emotion. My work shows that this is not true um, for a lot of people um, using uh, Chinese medicine. When people, uh, for, uh, patients and families talk about distress, uh, they would often use the word, uh, the phrase, uh, thinking too much, uh, or they would often use the word thinking too much or in Chinese, uh, xiang tai duo, uh, which means that um, you have a lot of chaotic thoughts and thoughts that are uh, misguided in a way, and that pre, uh, those thoughts pre- preoccupy you. And but of course, Chinese medicine has a way to tie up these kind of uh, mental and emotional processes with physiological processes. So uh, if you think too much, uh, your bodily energy becomes congested in a way that, for example, produces an anomaly in um, your liver and produces, say, uh, mucus con- con- congestion, etc. Of course, with the caveat that these terms, uh, organ terms, for example, should be understood um, in a, more, a much more complicated Chinese medicine way. It's not liver in the kind of biomedical sense. So in Chinese, when people say depression, um, they often use the term being sad and congested, meaning that um, 
the kind of whole cognitive and physiological process just got stuck because of the preoccupation that one has. And um, as a way to solve that, um, the whole family would often try to say, re, uh, reorient the person's attention um, and also try to use readily available um, substances, including everyday food, to try to um, smoothen the flow of the bodily energy. Um, so that's how an att- uh, kind of the relational aspect, the, the emotional aspect, and the physiological aspect all got uh, woven together in the use of, say, uh, some very simple Chinese medicine terms. You also mentioned that some people actually use traditional Chinese medicine to correct some of the harms of of psychopharmacology. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering Mm -hmm. if you could say a little bit more about that. Well, for example, some of the uh, more common uh, quote-unquote side effects of psychopharmaceuticals uh, are, for example, obesity or sometimes, for example, liver damages, et cetera. And um, uh, families not just families, but also psychiatrists in China actually prescribe some uh, Chinese medicine to address those damages of psychopharmaceuticals in a way that help the person achieve a a more balanced diet to counter some of the effects of psychopharmaceuticals. And also, for example, when uh, there is a Chinese term called uh, 热气 or um, being disturbed by the hot energy. So... Uh, they would understand, for example, some of the liver damages in that term, or being, uh, being disturbed by the hot energy. And they would use a cooling Chinese medicine to address and to, to reduce that uh, hot energy, to balance that hot, hot energy. So those are some of the uh, common ways in which not just family members or impacted people themselves, but also uh, practitioners actually uh, use Chinese medicine on an everyday basis. So you you also mentioned that in your experience and in what you've observed in your field work that psychiatrists aren't in China aren't completely entirely ignoring mm-hmm. sort of the social person and mm-hmm. so you've observed psychiatrists listening and being attentive to relationship issues and trying to intervene in that area but that because because of the dom- dominant psychiatric paradigm that mm-hmm. kind of can't be the first priority so I'm wondering how what you've observed about how Chinese psychiatrists are navigating that tension? That's a great question. I would say that is person by person. I think in order to understand um, Chinese mental health care, especially for people diagnosed with quote-unquote serious mental illnesses like schizophrenia, bipolar disorders, etc., what is available to them is really just institutional and the pharmaceutical care. Uh, there's almost no social worker in any psychiatric hospital and um, counseling is not seen as appropriate for people with serious mental illnesses. So the upshot for that is that um, psychiatrists uh, who um, are more reflexive, they feel the need to carry on some of the roles of, say, being a social worker, being a counselor themselves. So because of uh, families' heavy involvement of involuntary hospitalization and involvement in shouldering the payment for that, um, they often appear in a hospital to discuss things from the admission to the discharge of the patient. So even though the ultimate decision lies in the family uh, family members, um, psychiatrists have a lot of way to influence uh, family members' decisions. Um, For example, say if a person wants to uh, get married after their discharge and and a family member is concerned about that, so a a psychiatrist could and some some of them would make recommendations about what to do and what to uh, how to lead a life that is say socially and um, emotionally a more fulfilling than just being a person taking meds and not doing anything else after discharge. So there there's room for psychiatrists to do that, but it, again, it's 
uh, pretty ad-, ad hoc and nobody actually asks them to do that and um, nobody trains them to do that. And um, a lot of psychiatrists would, would not have the time and room to do that for every person. It's just an out of sympathy for maybe uh, a few patients. And I think that sort of in order to promote or the kind of uh, potential helping a person socially and emotionally is that, uh, and holistically in a psychiatrist, we do need to fundamentally redesign the job for, for a psychiatrist and also to build a more holistic team of care for peop- uh, people with uh, serious mental illnesses. Yeah, so to, to build on that, though, especially since the contemporary field of mental health is still kind of emerging and evolving in China and its mm-hmm. infrastructure and policies and laws are changing in real time, mm-hmm. I'm wondering what directions you are hoping to see the field move in. So, for example, um, social workers are definitely um, emerging in large numbers in China and um uh, some of them are tasked to serve people with mental illnesses in the community. So some of them are employed in community agencies, whereas a handful uh, are currently employed in hospitals. So I think it is very important for us, uh, not just because I'm currently teaching at a social work school, but um, because uh, it, just in general, it is very important for us to think about what the social workers' roles are are and should be in mental health care, whether they're just sort of like smoothening the engine of biomedicine or whether there's actually space for them to propose, um, say, an alternative uh, reading of the person to propose alternative treatment than uh, psychopharmaceuticals and whether there's room for them to not just do a, the kind of daily care and services, but also to participate in the kind of policy dialogue and rethink the current para, paradigm of care that um, puts all the responsibility on family members. Uh, that is, uh, whether there's room for them to say that, hey, um, independent living is possible. Uh, not every person has to live with their family members and we need to have resources to do that, uh, things like that. So I think we definitely need to closely watch the development of social work, mental health social work in China and um, uh, watch the everyday practices of social workers. Um, that is one thing that I think is very high on the list. What precipitated the emergence of social work in China at this moment? And do you see evidence that they are being able to engage in that policy dialogue? Well, I think um, social work has been growing very rapidly in China for about... Definitely more than uh, definitely more than a decade now. Um, not just in the mental health field, though, but as a kind of overall social service. And the reason for that is, of course, multiple. But I would think that the Chinese state is definitely moving toward the space of trying to envision a mode of shared governance and instead of just top-down governance, and also trying to sort of like address some of the some of the lacuna in terms of the social management after uh the collapse of many socialist entities say the uh the work units uh the work unit being say suppose a factory or uh things that in the high socialist era would not just employ people to do work but also provide everyday services, resources to factory workers, etc. So after the collapse of uh, work units like that, uh, the state is trying to think about ways to fill in those lacuna. So uh, uh, social work came in to address these concerns. So whether I see social work uh, or whether I see social workers being capable to participate in policy dialogues, I'd say a very tentative yes, in the sense that there are psychiatrists, um, leading psychiatrists who who don't think that biomedicine is going to um, solve everything, and um, uh, we definitely need, and that we definitely need a more holistic understanding of the person. So, in cities like Guangzhou or Shenzhen in the south, social workers have been very active in terms of 
helping us rethink uh, mental health services. But overall, psychiatrists are still very dominant in the game and other helping professionals like social workers, counselors, etc. Uh, they need a much better uh, space to engage. Uh, right now, they're still more or less seen as secondary That also makes me wonder whether the voices of people with lived experience are being included in these discussions. That's actually a great question, and that's the direction of my uh, next project. Uh, Right now, I'm working with people with lived experience, with progressive social workers, uh, psychiatrists, and policymakers in South China to think about and actually uh, try to launch a program to include people with lived experience into a service provision, a service design, and also policy dialogues. Uh, we hope to do it systematically so that the system would recognize these people's voices and expertise. And that's what I hope to do in the next few years. Those are the questions I have for you. So is there anything else you wanted to add or talk about before we wrap up today? I just wanted to add that by looking at the practice of involuntary hospitalization and the dominance of biomedical services in China, it also provides a way for us to understand uh, health disparities in the country in a way that doesn't just valorize uh, biomedicine. Because in China, we're seeing actually two things happening uh, or two things existing at the same, at the same time. So in cities or in uh, places where psychiatric hospitals are available, families often resort to involuntary hospitalization to solve any perceived chaos in the, fa- uh, in, in the household. And um, the state is encouraging that, much to the dismay of the person with lived experience themselves. But on the other hand, in rural areas of China uh, and in places where uh, there's no psychiatric hospitals, there's almost no service at all for people in need. So psychiatrists would, um, some leading psychiatrists would use the latter half of the phenomenon to say that we need, uh, instead of deinstitutionalization, we we need more institutions uh, and more institutionalization in China to address the kind of healthcare shortage. So. My response is that I um, I agree, I do see the disparity in um, existing resources, but I think by looking at the damage and complications of involuntary hospitalization and um, uh, the sole focus on biomedicine, we should ask, in areas that still lack services, what kind of services do we need want to develop? Are we Do we just want to develop care as usual, care as existing in these urban areas? Or are we, uh, do we want to develop more community-based, inclusive care, care that <clears throat> could inter- integrate uh, alternative, un- alternative understandings of the human, etc.? cetera? So um, we should grab the opportunity of developing services in these areas to rethink the whole service paradigm. And that's what uh, I want to say. I don't think the lack of hospitals or mental health uh, services uh, should be used as an excuse or a reason to repeat what has been done in uh, other areas of the country. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates. 